Okay, good morning. Uh, I guess this is the last applications oriented lecture, right? It is. Yeah, so what we'll talk about is functional imaging and we'll do everything with diffuse optics today. Um, I think you've already heard we had that really nice industry roundtable, so you know we're all working with industry and as I mentioned at the roundtable, I'm a co-founder of Modulated Imaging, which is a spatial frequency domain imaging technology. We work with other companies. Uh, so that's an increasingly important component of our field as we develop these methods and try to get them out of our laboratories and into the clinic and basic biology research as well. So we're going to talk about medical imaging with light. And um, actually, for those of you who've been to Venn, you probably can go home now <laughs> you, or go to the beach. You have an hour and a half. You've seen all, the, you've seen all this before. So... Um, Basically, medical imaging, if you talk to a radiologist, they're the discipline that does medical imaging. They, they think of MR, X-ray, nuclear, ultrasound. Those are the big ones, kind of the big four. Uh, optics is not on their radar screen at all. It, it, well, in some places, certainly in academic institutions, but it's not really widely thought of as a medical imaging modality. Um, of course, interventionists, people who are taking things in their hands and doing things to patients like interventional cardiologists or GI physicians, gastroenterologists who do endoscopy. They're thinking about optics in some way because they're using all those optical tools. So optics is usually sort of stuck out here in the big picture of medical imaging. But I just want to review some of the standard of care for medical optics. And I mentioned a little of this on Tuesday night in our workshop, but here are some pictures that hope, I hope that it drives home, helps drive home the message. So medical optics really is standard of care. You guys are fortunate enough to be in school now and working on beautiful technologies that probably, if you keep working on them, they'll have a path that maybe can move into commercialization and, and into the clinic. If you go back 25 years, 30 years, uh, there really wasn't very much. So now we have about, from an imaging and spectroscopy point of view, over a $20 billion market for medical optics. The lion's share of it is in endoscopy, so lots of endoscopy going on. Some endoscopy makes the news not necessarily good news. I think probably everybody's followed the Olympus scope scandals or problems with patients dying and the inability to actually fully sterilize those scopes. But Endoscopy is, in many, many forms, uh, probably the biggest and most important optical technique in medicine today. And it's continuing to evolve. And probably the biggest implication of endoscopy is not just that you can go into people, into the body and look in specific regions, but you can do surgery as well. So minimally invasive surgeries that are driven by endoscopy is hugely important. Does anybody know? what sort of the biggest company out there is. I mean, I know some of you do know. You can't answer this question. But uh, there's a very, very large company that that's their entire business model. And they're publicly traded. And they have a really high stock price. You just prevented everyone from who knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, I mean like the Beckman people, so. Okay, we can, we can open it up. <laughs> Intu intuitive Surgical. So, you know, their company, one of the fastest growing companies in Wall Street, they traded over $500 a share. Um, and uh, it's a hugely important technology. There's another company that just recently announced that they're going to go after Intuitive Surgical's uh, market share leading position. Anybody know what that company is? You could get jobs with these companies. You guys have to know. Bigger. <laughs> I think it's bigger. Maybe about the same size. Well, it's hard to, uh, hard to say now. I don't know what the size of it is because they, re they just recently restructured and they have a new company. They're called Alphabet. <laughs> yeah, so Google announced that they're going to do robotic surgeries, optically guided, 
I mean, it's a really huge, it's a huge development that impacts all of you directly because you're going to be graduating. How many of you are working on fiber optics, things that you can see far away inside the body potentially? I mean, you could get a job with Google. <laughs> so in the eye, um, there's, uh, oh, sorry, the slides got sort of transposed there. Of course, there is actually eye oximetry, but this is supposed to be oximetry over here. So in the eye, OCT alone is over a billion dollar a year market. There are, I've lost track of how many companies there are in OCT, maybe about a dozen or so. Um, the eye has been the first application for imaging and why it's just so beautiful, perfectly matched to the eye. You have coherent imaging uh, using interferometric gating. You can visualize all the retinal nerve fiber layers. So these are all the nerve fiber layers of the retina. There's this depression here. Anybody know what that's called? Fovea. That's the foveal pit. So this is the highest density of photoreceptors in the eye. Uh, they're virtually all cones in that region. You only see rods more around towards the periphery of the retina. So super high density of photoreceptors, extremely important to visualize this anatomy. And these are all retinal nerve fiber layers. And then here, you actually are going to see the, um, uh, the uh, pigmented, uh, the retinal pigmented epithelium and the vascular structures, the choroid and the vascular, uh, the, the retinal um, blood vessels. You can visualize those blood vessels as well with OCT. So this is an image from uh, Zongping Chen, our colleague at the BLI, um, where, and, and I think all of you have seen these types of optical angiography or Doppler OCT. There are many different names for it, speckle variance OCT. Uh, but fundamentally, all of them are looking at the same thing. They're looking at the coherent backscattered or coherent reflected signal using gating, but just gating on the moving scattering particles. So if you just gate on the moving scattering particles, you can reconstruct the structures in that tissue that contain those moving particles. And so that's the microvasculature. And this is a projection image, so you can get an appreciation of depth. You have varying degrees of quantitation associated with that. So depending upon the technique, you can actually quantify the flow in every one of those microvascular structures. Of course, the more careful you are to quantify, uh, you give something up, you give up speed, you give up some aspects of, uh, well, mostly speed and field of view. So it's a very, very beautiful technique. These are all anatomic approaches. They're moving very fast in the commercial space. Uh, this will be introduced and, and is just is beginning to be introduced in commercial ophthalmic OCT systems. And then functional techniques, this is oximetry. So the, these in total, these methods are kind of on the order of about a billion dollar a year market, a little over a billion dollars a year. Um, one of the most notable and the one I like to uh, point out, particularly for, um, for our community, is pulse and hemoglobin oximetry and, and the work that Massimo has done with bedside non-invasive monitors of total hemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, important blood chemistry that can be done at the bedside. So this is critical functional information uh, that's used widely in medicine. There are many, many applications. Uh, of course, if you think about it, we, we do need to know what hemoglobin concentration is in blood. It's a critical parameter um, for so many different conditions. Uh, fundamentally, um, if a patient is hemorrhaging, uh, you need to know that, and you need to know that dynamically. If they're receiving chemotherapy, they're just virtually everything across medicine. It's, uh, it's very important. And then there are oximetry techniques where you look at oxygen saturation. And this one that was originally developed by a company called Somanetics, uh, it's the INVOS instrument that measures oximetry. They, they tend to have the market share, the leadership in, in terms of market share, although there are a number of companies now that have emerged in this space. If you go into a pediatric intensive care unit or a neonatal intensive care unit, you'll see babies with these probes on their foreheads. And it's really virtually everywhere in the US and around the world. Uh, they're designed, anybody know why it's particularly prevalent in pediatric or neonatal intensive care? to look at brain oximetry. It's 
too early in the morning. <laughs> well, so the fingertip sensor is pretty good for looking at optometry in your fingertip. And it may or may not really tell you anything about what's going on in the brain. So with these sensors and these devices, you're actually actually able to look directly into the brain, brain of babies. Babies. Uh, uh, babies, are, babies are pretty optically transparent. And, and this, is, this is a critical parameter because their lungs are not fully de developed. So, so it's not always clear whether or not they're getting adequate perfusion and oxygenation to the brain. So these are very nice trend detectors. Uh, you can see if the neonate, I mean, have any of you been to a neonatal intensive care unit or seen what a neonate looks like? How big are they? Yeah, they're like tiny, you know, sort of like the size of your cups. <laughs> and, and so it's, you know, they're put in incubators. There are not that many parameters that physicians can change or control, but one of them that they can change it are, are the oxygen tension conditions in the incubator itself. So if there's poor perfusion, if there's low oxygenation in their brains as a result of the immature lungs, then you can change that, you can follow that. So it's a really beautiful trend detector. Um, so the, this device and that company was acquired by this company, Covidian. Anybody heard of Covidian? I know you guys have heard of Covidian. <laughs> so why do I pause there? They could give you jobs as well. So <laughs> Covidian is, uh, I think it's the largest, do you guys know, is it the largest medical device company in the world? It's one of the largest. It's hard to separate out some of the others, like GD and Philips Medical. Mm-hmm. Because it is about 10 billion. Yeah. That's me up for before. And then after they get sued from Asmo, they change the names to COVID-19. Yes. Yeah. So it's a really interesting history, and they continue to acquire companies. They could, maybe they'll acquire one of your guys' companies. So all you have to do is... Uh, is come up with that really clever idea, get it established and show that it works, no problem, and Covidian will acquire you. That's your exit strategy. So, <laughs> so all this stuff, imaging and spectroscopy, is about a $20 billion a year market already. And um, so, you know, we like to, uh, we, we like to think that the medical grade things are really unique, and of course they are, but, um, as uh, my, my colleague Tom O'Sullivan and I like to point out, there's this blurry line between this stuff that traditional medical device companies are making and all of this stuff, the consumer grade electronics. And again, you know, we were talking on Tuesday, so you, maybe you'll get a job with Covidian, but maybe you'll get a job with Apple or Fitbit or Samsung or LG, uh, as actually several of our recent graduates have. There's clearly a movement in those companies to develop personal health monitoring devices. Uh, they will become increasingly important as people get them in their hands. It's kind of what we like to think of as the democratization of technology. You will have information that you can control yourself. It will go, of course, into networks in the cloud, and somebody else will then be controlling it. You won't, you'll think you're controlling it, but somebody else will have access to it. Who knows who that will be? Most likely your health care provider. Um, probably Kaiser in the future. They'll have those networks. They'll probably, uh, ultimately, Apple may own them and Google may own them. And all this information is now or as increasingly accessible um, and can be generated with innovative hardware and input devices. Of course, a really big challenge remains. We're all very used to the idea on this side of making a measurement. How many of you guys make measurements on living systems, people, or animals. When you make those measurements, how long do you make the measurement for, typically? They're just an hour? That would, that would be, but you're not continuously measuring stuff for an hour. So you may have a probe, you may put it on, and then put it some other place, and you know maybe it'll take an hour. Um, a pulse ox is a little bit different because you, you, know, you clip that on, but these types of devices, the implication with all of this is that you can be transmitting information continuously 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's going to introduce entirely new challenges in terms of data analysis. So there's a huge amount of information content that's going to go into Apple's network and Google's network. And there will, there will be, you hear a lot about big data, and nobody actually knows exactly what big data is, but I think that's big data. Big data is hardware devices sampling at 30, 60, or higher hertz that are sending information about your dynamic physiology into these networks. And there's a huge opportunity to really figure out new signals and the meanings of new signals. We're typically analyzing maybe 10 seconds worth of data, or if it's continuously acquired, or you know, at the longest, it may be 30 seconds worth of data. And so we'll apply our signal processing techniques for that. But with this type of stuff, it's entirely new. And let me just give you a thought example. So it took 100 years for blood pressure to sort of be figured out as a reliable predictor of risk of heart disease. And it's a pretty, you know, it's a very manual technique. Everybody knows how blood pressure works. What if you had a new measurement that was better than blood pressure? How could you possibly figure that out? Well, if suddenly you have one of your sensors, one of your devices, hooked up to 10, 20, 100, 1,000, 10,000 people, getting information continuously, and you can correlate all that information with other aspects of their life, and then that's all analyzed in a big data format, you may be able to derive new measures that will be better or as good as blood pressure using less obtrusive, less invasive, and more uh, expedient types of devices. So this is basically where the trend is and where things are going to be going. So that kind of leads into the, you know, the next big question, what's next with medical optics? And um, you know, clearly, I think, and I, I, many, many people in, in our field, I think, uh, are also in agreement that one of the power, the great power of biophotonics is we can bring the technology to the patient. Um, these are, by and large, fairly low cost and low barrier to access technologies. And uh, if you put them in the, in the sort of conventional medical domain, uh, physicians, once they get them in their hands, they can see something and then they can treat it. So it gives information right back to the clinician, and they can act on that. And a, you know, a classic example of this is the somanetics device that's in the neonatal intensive care unit. And physicians can see what the trends are in terms of brain oxygenation. And then they can change the oxygen tension in the incubator. Why don't you want to just blast the baby with 100% you know, oxygen and just forget about having any feedback? Any, any ideas? Is that, is that bad? Is 100% oxygen bad? How come? You can go to oxygen bars, especially in Asia. I think there are several of them in the airport in Narita. We, we create little baby oxygen addicts. <laughs> there is definitely getting used to, there's a negative physiology associated with it. What is the principal negative physiology? And it actually took people many years to figure out. And it's a super interesting story that involves Dr. Arnold Beckman. So, so what will happen is the, the babies, as their eyes are developing, they'll have over-proliferation of vasculature in their, in their retinas, and they will go blind. So the high oxygen tension levels stimulate angiogenesis and improper development of blood vessels in the eye. And so this was observed over many years that babies who were put, when everybody was excited that incubators were developed, so now you could have premature infants survive, and they gave them 100% oxygen. And it wasn't until Dr. Beckman developed an oxygen analyzer that could measure oxygen tension in the incubator 
So his was a dual use application. You know, a lot of times we talk about civilian use and military use. So he had a civilian use that was put oxygen analyzers in incubators to prevent blindness in babies, in neonates. What do you think his military application was? It was a World War II application. For all you World War II military history buffs. What would you do with an oxygen analyzer in the military? Any branch of the military. Navy. Navy, that's the hint. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you had people like passing out and losing consciousness and in, you know, losing ability to focus because we know that you need to maintain a certain oxygen tension level in the brain if you become hypoxic or ischemic. So you pack in, I don't know how many men, and I'm sure it was all men at the time, into a, sub, a tiny submarine with not very much air exchange. Uh, it, the conditions can be quite dangerous. So oxygen analyzers and submarines were a huge innovation that allowed their use. So this is kind of a background. Um, the, the goals, what do we want to do with the new technologies? And I think this unites everybody here. Some, somehow, we need to see beneath the surface. And, and conventionally, if you go to the radiologist, even if you talk to endoscopists, they don't typically think of light as being a technology that penetrates beneath the surface. Increasingly in endoscopy with confocal microendoscopy, does anybody know a company that makes confocal microendoscopes and actually has a very successful business model? Remember, it's a $50 billion a year industry, so there must be some companies out there. Selvisio, Mauna Kea device. It's actually quite, quite popular. And there's uh, a company that makes confocal microscopes for looking in skin dermatology. And Vossen knows this very, very well. In fact, greetings from Milland. I saw him last week. Um, They've been working for over 20 years to bring this technology into the clinic. And it's there now, and it's reimbursable. So it's a confocal microscope where you can look into skin and look at basal cell carcinoma, melanoma, characterization of skin disease beneath the surface. It's really beautiful. What I find to be absolutely stunning with this, we know one of the key developers of that technology Milan Rajnishka, is that how I pronounce it? Oh, okay. Yeah, Rajesh, yeah. <laughs> Milan. And so he's been working on it probably 25 years. It's reimbursable now. And when we talk to our colleagues in dermatology here, they're super excited about this new confocal technology, this, this brand new thing that they've never heard of before. And it's just amazing. And can they work with us on it? Of course, Millen has been in the coal mines working on it, in the dungeons working for 25 years. So that's, that's how long it takes. But why does it take that long? Well, for some things. We want to see beneath the surface. And it's really hard to convince a clinician to adopt a technology unless you can explain the underlying biologic origins of what you're seeing. So that's a big part of what we need to be doing as a community. You may get lucky and be able to do that for your dissertations. But that's a key thing. At least have some ideas. Be able to articulate the relationship between your optical signal and what's going on in biology or physiology. And then here, this is the big, big challenge. This is the sort of the highest peak that we have to climb to, the summit. And, and that's to make a quantitative measurement and then somehow link it to a clinical outcome. And we talked a little bit Tuesday night about why this is important, clinical outcome. And in a, in a nutshell, it's important because all of medicine is shifting to this whole area where everything that is going to be geared towards doing things for the patient that will improve their outcome. And if you don't have evidence that your technology, your intervention, is actually improving the outcome for the patient, you're, you're probably going to get left in the dust. 
unless it's something that's been grandfathered in and everybody is just using. So that's a really important thing to consider. It's very difficult to structure studies that link an optical measurement to a clinical outcome. Um, and I'll show you an example of one study that we've been working on that does that. Uh, and hopefully that can inspire you to think about how you guys want to do it. But um, one great way to do it is, is to work in teams and to really access clinical colleagues, scientists, engineers, and, and you know, just go through the iterative process of brainstorming. If you have a good technology that measures something and there's a contrast origin that you understand, if you think hard enough and work hard enough, you will be able to link it to an outcome. So here everybody is kind of familiar with this big picture of tissue optical imaging um, where on the y-axis we have resolution, so you give up resolution to go deeper in tissue. And what I really want to point out with this is that uh, these blue-coated uh, technologies, uh, nanoscopic, microscopic, coherence tomography, these methods, they all rely on the wave character of light and they utilize some sort of gating strategy to suppress multiply scattered photons. So multiply scattered photons are, are, are the enemy <laughs> of these methods. You lose contrast and resolution, essentially, with multiply scattered photons. So you can use interferometric gating, geometric gating, holographic gating, electronic gating, as in nonlinear techniques. So everything about these methods is designed to preserve the purity of coherence uh, in some form or another. Um, but as you go into tissue uh, to depths of about a transport scattering length, about a depth of a millimeter, um, that's a battle that you're losing. Y you know, you just, you can't gate everything out. You just won't have enough photons to make your measurements information rich enough. So at this point, we think of light as a particle, and you guys have been developing lots of expertise in this in both domains. Uh, so there's this sort of transition and an in-between uh, domain. Um, but if you think of light as particles, then you can use a, a diffusion approximation or similar types of approximations. And we have these methods, diffuse tomographies, macroscopic imaging, photoacoustic techniques. Um, photoacoustic is, is a little bit different, but the driver, of course, are multiply scattered photons. And we're, I'm going to go into some examples of diffuse tomography and macroscopic imaging. One of the interesting things and, and kind of a nice feature of our field that you can bring out and flaunt in front of your colleagues in other areas is that um, regardless of whether you're working in a diffuse tomography or microscopic imaging or even nanoscopic imaging, if you look at uh, a lot of Vadim Bachman's work in coherent backscattering imaging techniques, um, is that the contrast is preserved across spatial scales. So while this method may be looking at multiple light scattering, you're looking fundamentally at a scattering signature that comes from particles that are uh, cellular in origin and even subcellular. And we may or may not get to an example of that. <laughs> um, I have that at the end of the talk. So macroscopic imaging and diffuse optics. Um, did uh, June give a demo at all? So this is, here's a, this is a picture of me with um, four uh, 850 nanometer LEDs in my mouth. There's no light from the outside. It's all just coming from the inside. Uh, this is actually a technology that you met June on Tuesday night, June Yu. He's, uh, um, he's started several companies. One of them is Praxis, and uh, it's commercializing this particular technology. Um, so they hope to use it to, as a quick screening for sinus infections in kids. Uh, and um, there's lots of interest and it's kind of it's very promising. I like to use this in particular as a way of illustrating um, that there's a lot of light in the near infrared in biological tissues. And it, it is transported across fairly large distances, several centimeters here, going through hard tissue and soft tissue. And it's always fascinating for me to see how it's emerging you know, from my pupil. There's, this is illumination from inside. And um, I have several images of myself actually over 20 years. And they all pretty much look the same from the inside. The outside is changing. <laughs> but the inside looks pretty about the same. And then I'll also talk about the idea of using wide field illumination with patterns. And you guys have been learning a lot about this as well. 
Um, I'll show some examples of, of how you can employ that. And those patterns, just like the light here, is blurred as it transports through many, many centimeters of tissue. Uh, the, the patterns are blurred as they propagate deep into the tissue. And if you can measure the rate of pattern blurring, then you can control the optical path length and you can say something quantitative about the tissue. So our big challenge, and you know, in some ways you guys already had this set before you at the beginning of the week, um, and you've been working on that, but just to sort of reiterate that, is, is to measure optical path length when we go into turbid materials. Um, we know what it is with a cuvette measurement. You don't know what it is if there's multiple light scattering. If you could know what it was, if you, could, if you could control it, then you could be quantitative and you could just use Beer's Law. You'll separate absorption from scattering. So from a physics point of view, the advantage of measuring and controlling optical path length is that you can separate absorption from scattering and you can localize information in 3D. You can do tomography. From a physiology point of view, why is that advantageous? Well, you could convert this information, these mucibase and mucibes primes, into measures of perfusion and metabolism at depth. And you can determine the concentration, so that would be oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. You can determine the concentration of other near-infrared absorbers and fluorophores. So uh, we have in the near-infrared a very beautiful signature from water and lipid. Um, believe it or not, those hemoglobin signatures, well, Massimo has already figured this out, but those hemoglobin signatures are not just oxy and deoxy. There are other components, and especially if you have pathology in physiology. And even if you just have a bruise, um, with, is it, which is a, it's a hemorrhage of vascular structures, over time, because the body is working to get rid of that blood, there are hemoglobin metabolites that have unique spectral features. So all that stuff can be measured. And you can, if you're good enough with this and you know the optical properties, then you can correct um, distortions introduced by the optical properties. Those distortions can impact fluorescence that you measure. How many of you guys are doing fluorescence? Are you doing deep tissue fluorescence or more? Uh, more superficial. But, I mean, you're, you're in the land of optical property correction for distortion. So it's hugely important and it can help you visualize. So you will be, I'm sure, correcting for distortions in deep structures. Are you going to work on some of the brain imaging? Um, right now we're doing some skin imaging for, for skin cancer. Um, after photodynamic therapy. Yes, yeah. And skin is super turbid. I mean, if you're just looking right at the surface, you may not have to correct for a distortion. But if you're looking, even in skin, the, the, the stratum corneum, is the index is so high. Uh, and we know this because we do a lot of nonlinear imaging that relies on coherence and, and the simultaneous arrival of multiple photons. And, and you just see, for no good reason, the signals just disappear. Uh, because of the fact that there's so much scattering that it reduces the instantaneous excitation intensity at depth. So 50 microns, 100 microns, all those ballistic photons are just scattered all over the place. Uh, so it's a super turbid material. Um, so this is uh, potentially an extremely important uh, application of what we're doing. If you want to go deeper than a few hundred microns even, uh, you, you, you would like to correct for that. And certainly in keratinized structures. So they're basically, from a kind of academic, didactic point of view, there are sort of three ways to control path length. And, and the first way, and probably all of you know this intuitively, but it's important to point out, because this is probably the most powerful way to control path length, and that's to control wavelength. So if you look at um, path length, uh, in the domain where scattering lengths and absorption lengths are about equal. And then you move into the near-infrared region, the scatter-dominated region, where absorption lengths are much, much greater than scattering lengths. So absorption lengths out here are maybe in, the, in 10 centimeters, 5, 10 centimeters. Scattering lengths are, what are the scattering lengths in the near-infrared? This is your spot quiz.
any guesses? Actual scattering lengths, not transport scattering length. How far will photons propagate on average before they encounter a scatterer? In the near infrared. Or undergo a scattering event. Maybe about 20 to 40 microns. So very short scattering lengths. So in this scatter-dominated region, where scattering is so much more probable than absorption, you can have an increase in the optical path length from a few millimeters uh, to you know, tens of millimeters. So 15, 20-fold increase in optical path length. And that's huge. And that's actually something that you can take advantage of if you're trying to interrogate tissue at different depths. So a classic example is just looking at different colors of light. Uh, transmitted. This is through a rabbit ear, and you can see very stark contrast with the vascular structures here in the blue and the green, and you lose that in the red. Just a lot of light comes through. That's sort of a practical visual way to appreciate that. But even if you're out here in the near infrared, and oxygenation in the tissue is changing. So you can have another two-fold change in the optical path length going from 50% saturation to 100% saturation. So even out in that domain, small changes in physiology, well actually that's a pretty big change in physiology going from 50 to 100%, but not unusual in working muscle or working brain or if you're driving a photodynamic process, it's very, very common. So you can have another two-fold change in optical path length just through those spectroscopic transitions alone. And yeah, this is kind of a good illustration of that sort of concept of optical path length and wavelength dependence. So believe it or not, that's me. So, and <laughs> it's me on the left. Um, this is 400 nanometer uh, illumination of my face, where absorption lengths and scattering lengths are about equal. And the light clearly is not penetrating very deeply. So you see contrast in that image that's entirely different from this image, 850 nanometer illumination. Absorption lengths are much, much greater than scattering lengths. So anybody know where all the contrast is coming from here? Melanin. That's mostly from melanin. Where is the melanin? Where is it, actually? It's clearly not in certain regions of my beard. <laughs> I've lost it there. How deep is melanin? At the, at the basal layer. So how deep is that, though? Give me a number. Max. I mean, mine's about 50 to 60 microns. So it's remarkable that you see all that contrast coming from less than 100 microns of skin. And that, that's really super high contrast. And there are different types of melanin that absorb a little bit differently, just a little bit. They, they have fluorescence signatures that are even more different. Did Mihaela show some of the fluorescence of melanin? No? Um, so this is a pretty uh, high contrast image. Um, and uh, you can see I have melanin localized. Some people call that freckles. But other, and then, you know, like if others of you do the same thing, you won't necessarily see the same dotty structure like that. Um, and then this is uh, at 850 nanometers. So where's the contrast there? coming from? Hemoglobin. So the, the light is going into the tissue. It says, you know, we'll just go right by the basal layer. We don't really care so much about the attenuation of the melanin. And those photons just keep going, and they get scattered from deeper structures in the dermis. So the vascular plexus is coming right up in capillary loops to the epidermis. It doesn't go into the epidermis, but it's in the dermis in capillary loops. And so you have all that vascular plexus in the dermis. And, and that's principally where the attenuation is coming from. But because of multiple light scattering, the light is pooling just beneath the surface. And you guys are modeling that and visualizing that. And you can see that beautiful multiple light scattering signature. I look a lot better in 850 nanometer light. and um, that's actually a principle that cosmetic companies take advantage of. How do they do that? They must block the, uh, the shorter wavelengths. 
that's one thing they do. And, but that's also designed you know, to advertise that we have uh, protective effects in our, in our products you know, so you don't get burned. But that is, that's one thing. What else do they do? They make the light a little bit diffuse. There's another company that you guys can work for. So L'Oreal, Unilever, Avon, we know that they all have active programs in biophotonics and biomedical optics. And they're very interested in skin optics, of course. So you can put small particles on the surface of the skin, also known as makeup, uh, to <laughs> multiply scatter light and give you more of a diffuse glow. You look better. It's less expensive than giving everybody near-infrared imaging goggles, although that probably would work better. <laughs> Tom? Well, there, there is in your hair, so for sure. That's, that gives you the pigmentation in your hair, or some of us have more or less of it than others. Um, and uh, it changes over time, yeah. So the third way to control path length, or the uh, second way is, um, is actually controlling the spatial features of light. And um, we were talking about before that absorption lengths are quite long in the near infrared, about 10 centimeters. Scattering lengths are short, 20 to 40 microns. So that means if you have a spatially resolved measurement, then you can control the path length. And intuitively, I think you're all familiar with this. If you have a light source, and you have a detector close to the source, you're looking at more superficially propagating photons. If you have a detector further from the source, you're looking at deeper propagating photons. So if you make a measurement of the reflectance as a function of rho or source detector separation, then you'll see a very steep drop off. And you guys have probably already all done this, um, where you have a scatter dominated region and also a region that's dominated by both scattering and absorption. And, and that's a very powerful, compelling way. If you look at that uh, spatial um, control, and then anything you can do in space, you can do in time. So if you think of those scattering lengths and absorption lengths, and you convert them into times. So what is a scattering length? That's the mean distance light will travel before uh, there's a scattering event. An absorption length, the mean distance light will travel before there's an absorption event. If you divide that length by time, you have a relaxation time. And so that's the mean distance that light will travel, or the, the mean time b between scattering events and the mean time between absorption events. So tau absorption, absorption relaxation times in tissue are on the order of about half a nanosecond, less than a nanosecond. They're, that's slow. Um, in comparison to scattering relaxation times, which can be fractions of picoseconds. So if you make a time resolve measurement, you put in a short laser pulse, and so that's typically in the picosecond, few picosecond regime, then it will spread out in time. And as we argued with space, the early regions are scatter dominated, and the later regions are absorption dominated in time. And that's because as that light pulse, which carries photons, goes into tissue. If you wait a really long time, they'll travel further. You'll capture light that's traveled further. If you look at a very short time, you'll capture light that hasn't traveled as far. If you have no absorbers in your system, there's no loss. And so that's, this is a thought experiment. You take that pulse, and, and what will happen to it? So I, I launch my pulse into a non-absorbing system. Just elastic scatterers. So no inelastic scattering. It just keeps going. <laughs> and bouncing around. So, you know, it's just a thought experiment, really. But it helps you visualize the importance of absorption loss. So I just, then I, let's say I begin to put in a few absorbers. Now that will constrain the actual total optical path of those photons that are bouncing around aimlessly, wandering in my highly turbid material. So that you'll begin to see in this tail end, tail region of the temporal point spread function. 
So if you look at early arriving photons, then, and you are able to truly gate those out, those will be reflecting more superficial paths, later arriving photons, deeper paths. If you make a time-resolved measurement, and so you, if, you, if you look at some time resolution of your measurement, then you're essentially gating out the most superficial photons that you would see in a DC measurement. So if you don't have the temporal gating um, and look at that temporal point spread function, you'll have a lot of contribution from light that's at the surface that are superficially propagating. And so you can do, have you guys done this already? Have you visualized that? Yeah, oh, oh perfect, yes. It seems a lot of the time we don't really look at the orientation of the chromophore. Um, I mean, for, I guess, hemoglobin, it doesn't really matter because it will be moving. But um, especially like in the skin, the orientation, um, it depends on like how the light will be absorbed. So I was wondering if like you, you guys ever look on like the orientation of the chromophore. I know it might be a little bit hard. You mean like uh, dichroism or, or so mo yeah. a molecular characteristic, um, non-centrosymmetric yeah. or chiral? So it's pretty hard to pull out a measurement of chiral structures in the multiple scattering regime. But if you're using uh, coherent light, then those are properties that are conserved. And definitely people have, have tried to look at that. Um, so one example is an OCT where people look at polarization sensitive OCT and can look at the banded structures of chiral molecules which happen to be collagen in the skin. Um, so you see a lot of polarization dependence in light propagation through those types of structures. Or in coherent techniques, um, if you're familiar with second harmonic generation or some frequency generation, so that's a nonlinear technique that takes advantage of the chiral structure of collagen fibers. Um, Let's say if you, you know, you've got molecules that rotate light differentially, like DNL glucose, that's been a popular target that nobody's ever been able to solve, uh, despite a lot of money being invested in it. Um, it's really hard to pull out very sensitively the chiral structure contribution from chiral molecules like glucose at any depth. That I mean, can be done in a pure cuvette. For, for that, that's a little bit more, I guess, like scattering. but. Um, well, the scattering the degrades, so you have to probe it with polarized light and then analyze it with polarized light. And so the scattering degrades all of that. So you have to have polarization preserving ways. And that's best done with coherent backscattering techniques, um, like OCT types of techniques, or um, Vadim Bachman and, and Adam Wax have done a lot of really beautiful coherent backscattering approaches. But then they won't be probing really deep. But there is a sweet spot that you could possibly, where is the sweet spot in between the blood vessels and, uh, and the surface? Where you, you, can, you can potentially design some techniques like that from a physiology point of view. I've narrowed the space down for you. That's called the extravascular extracellular space. So interstitial fluid resides there. And there's quite a lot of activity in trying to analyze um, things like glucose and lactate and other metabolites in that interstitial fluid. So it's a pretty active area. The interstitial fluid is in the collagen and the vascular is at the papillary dermis, which is actually above that. Yes. So it's the ISF is below the, uh, the, the, uh, the vascular space. But there's some around the vasculature, okay. yeah. right? There's, there always will be because that's where it comes from. Yeah, that's yeah. where it comes from. Yeah. So it's not, unfortunately, we model it as layers, <laughs> but the actual physiology is not like that. Yeah. So we've got time, and so just kind of to summarize, um, in terms of measuring optical path length, we have, uh, in the real domain, um, we, we look at uh, both space and time as our controlling features. Um, in terms of time, we'll have an input pulse, and we'll look at the dispersion of that pulse in time. In terms of space, 
we have an input spot, still a pulse, it's a pulse in space, and we'll look at the dispersion of that in space. So this is kind of a, a really good way to think about um, how to do work in the frequency domain then. So Fourier transform equivalents of these real domain techniques or frequency domain techniques. This is a signal that's varying in time, and we look at its output in time. You can do the same thing in the frequency domain. So how do you do in the frequency domain a signal that's varying in time? You can impose some sort of sinusoidal modulation, a regular sinusoidal modulation function, uh, because you can represent a pulse of light in terms of sine and cosine components, frequency domain components. And then you can look at the uh, change in the phase and the amplitude of this sinusoidally propagating wave as it moves into tissue. And in the spatial frequency domain, you can do the same thing. Um, but here, we'll sinusoidally modulate our input in space rather than in time. Of course, you can do it in space and time if you have the right scheme. Um, and then the output is still sinusoidally varying, but uh, there'll be a change in that sinusoidal input. It won't be as sharp. It'll be blurrier, and the amplitude will have changed. So if you, from a instrumentation point of view, what we typically do here is take, uh, let's say, a fiber optic as a delivery device, or it can still be free space, um, but then uh, we'll typically put a detector on the surface of the tissue. So your sensitivity map is typically a bit deeper. In fact, it, you can completely transilluminate tissues this way. You can take a light source, you can put a detector on the other side. I was just recently visiting our colleagues at Hamamatsu in Japan, and they showed me for the first time, um, they, they had a nice uh, tabletop instrument, which is uh, it's a time-resolved instrument, and they ha were completely transilluminating the head. So now it's actually kind of going back to the original experiments that were done by Britt Chance and Enrico Gratton's lab, but they had a giant mode lock laser and a super sensitive microchannel plate photomultiplier tube. And, and um, so Professor Chance was able to see this pulse of light go completely through his, his head. But that was anything but portable. That was an entire room in a huge multi-million dollar center. Now these guys showed me they had a very nice portable tabletop system with pulsed diode lasers that were capturing. It took about five seconds of integration time uh, to get a, a, good, a good brain oximetry signal. It's pretty impressive. Just um, for the benefit of the course, um, what limits the ability to do temporal frequency domain measurements in a wide field imaging setup? You, you pointed to the fact that usually it's done using fiber optic delivery and collection yeah. as opposed to spatial modulation. Yeah. So basically it's the temporal response of your detector. Um, so you can, so the simplest way to think of it, if I, I could take that fiber optic, right, and expand that in space, if I have enough power, I can just illuminate the tissue in the temporal frequency domain. And we did these experiments in the 90s. <laughs> so everything will come back and, uh, you know, it can be done even better now. There's a practical difficulty then with measuring the phase and the amplitude of the light that's remitted and still preserve that spatial content. Now, with advances in flim microscopy, which is sort of that same concept, it's modulate flim fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, it's that same concept, illuminating a wide field, turning the light on and off, and then looking at the phase and the amplitude of the remitted light that shifted in energy to the fluorescent wavelength because the fluorescence follows in time the source function. You can do fluorescent imaging in every pixel. But the, the bandwidth constraints of fluorescence because of the relaxation times of the fluorescence process are not as rigorous as those. So absorption relaxation times are fractions of nanoseconds. Typical fluorescence lifetimes may be several nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds. So you don't have to go as fast. But with detector technology getting better and better, you can do that. Um, there's a, another way to do that. Anybody familiar with uh, using point detectors for, for imaging and compressive sensing? 
So a slight detour, I won't go into a lot of detail, but you can encode spatial information in time. So, so imagine that in this temporally modulated wide field projection, every pixel you were able to turn on and off at a slower frequency. So you're modulating the information that's going to talk about the tissue optics in the megahertz to gigahertz regime. But what if you had a way of making this pixel, turning it on and off at one kilohertz, and this pixel, two kilohertz, and this pixel, three kilohertz, and so forth. And so that was your carrier wave. And on top of that, let's say you had your sweeping from 10 megahertz out to one gigahertz. So those are techniques that are sort of adapted from telecommunications. The combination of multiple frequencies with carrier frequencies. And then spatial content is encoded in temporal frequencies. And then you just need a single point detector. And so then if you looked in, in Fourier space of your point detector output, you would say you would see pixel 0, 0 as being the one kilohertz signal, and then you could look at all the temporal frequency. So those are techniques that are coming as well, and we're fooling around with all of those. There's a, a lot of potential for that stuff. So good, good time to be working in the, and how would you do that, by the way? How would you turn light on and off in all different, at different rates at diff in different pixels? From a hardware point of view. Exactly. Spatial light modulators. And you're working on single point. That's exactly what you're, you're doing. So, And you, you were supposed to raise your hand when I said compressive sensing because you're doing compressive sensing. <laughs> so DMDs, spatial light modulators, are really, really powerful tools. You heard from David Kucha on Tuesday night. He started doing his PhD before there were DMDs. And, um, you know, that's a good example of why if you feel like you have a promising approach, a good technology, uh, stick with it because there will be technologic innovations that come along that can s accelerate it dramatically. Um, so keep your eyes open for those. They're, they're always being developed. Yes? I'm not familiar with the DMD. Is that, is that like a, a micro-mirror? Exactly. DMD is digital micro-mirror. Um, so it's part of a broader category of spatial light modulators. And they can be uh, liquid crystal on silicon, LCOS, so those are reflective ones. Um, they can be mirror-based, um, LCD-based. So, so the, the records um, are in the probably tens of kilohertz regime right now. Um, and um, some of the limitations, which I guess I probably... I have that at the very end of my talk. It's probably like my hundredth slide, so we'll probably never get to that. <laughs> um, there um, are how, how to load sinusoidal patterns, how fast you can load sinusoidal patterns. Um, but um, the intrinsic feature of a DMD is just an on-off switch. So you can also run them in binary mode in the tens of kilohertz, and uh, then you get square wave patterns. But of course, square waves are just a whole bunch of sinusoids put together. So they're something not to forget as important hardware-based input functions in our, in our methods. So let's see. I'm officially supposed to end at 10. Let's, if you can focus on temporal frequency domain, that would be helpful because they did SFDI yesterday. OK. okay. So here's a, a little bit more focus on temporal, as Vossen requested. <laughs> um, and, and you can, hopefully, you have all sort of taken a look at this review paper, uh, Tom O'Sullivan et al. And so if you intensity modulate the source, launch the light in tissue, you get this spherical wave that propagates in tissue, and that's damped. So the measurement that we make with the detector uh, some distance from the source in a, let's say it's a backscattering geometry, is actually kind of a near field measurement because the modulation wavelength of that photon density wave is pretty, pretty long. And, you know, maybe 10 centimeters or so. 
But we're not measuring typically 10 centimeters away. We're measuring maybe a few centimeters away. And we've got this diffusely propagating uh, light field. The phase velocity of that wave outside the tissue is basically the velocity of light in the medium that's propagating it. It goes in the tissue and the phase velocity becomes a tenth or a hundredth of the velocity of light because all the photons that are being carried along in that wave are now scattered multiply. They're spreading out in space and time. If you put an absorber in, it will constrain the paths and sort of shrink the spatial extent of this, this diffusely propagating wave. And so if you have a measurement that can accurately resolve the phase between a reference signal, the source input function, and the propagating light. So you measure the phase lag and the demodulation or, or the damping of that wave. And you can look at that as a function of frequency. Then you can compare that to your models and you'll calculate what the parameters are, the free parameters in the model, which really in the end, there are two free parameters that we care a lot about. And what are they? That's your test to see if you're awake. Two free parameters. Our favorite um, free parameters in tissue optics. Musibe and Musibes prime, yeah. So you want to calculate those, and you can do it by measuring the phase and the amplitude. So what does that actually look like? So this is going to be the amplitude as a function of frequency. You can see it's nonlinear because the model is nonlinear in its prediction of the behavior of the light propagation. This is the phase as a function of frequency. And if you fit that to the model, then you can get mu sub a and mu sub s prime. And one of the things that we then do in order, because you get mu sub a and mu sub s prime wherever you have a laser and a laser wavelength. So typically, you only have a few laser wavelengths. But if you fit the mu sub s prime as a function of wavelength to another, more or less, you might think of it as a law, a law of our field. It's uh, like a speed limit. You know, you can't, this one is just always going to be uh, a factor that governs light propagation in turbid materials. There's no structure to it. It varies smoothly. Um, in some sort of a power law. And you can derive uh, the, in a sort of a generalized form using a me theory approximation. Um, and we call A the, the prefactor and B the scatter power. So lots of work has been done in our community to describe the validity of that assumption. And this actually doesn't require us to assume anything other than this is smoothly varying according to this type of power law, and then we can derive the A and the B parameters. Now, some people have taken those A and B parameters and then tried to even further describe B is more or less telling us about the size of the scatterers, A is telling us about the density of the scatterers. That's yet another stretch. It's pretty hard to do that, but it's certainly possible. It gets much more complicated. But if you just use these factors, A and B, and combine that, of course, we've got individual wavelengths also for absorption. And we combine that with the reflectance spectra. So reflectance, you can take over a broad, this is probably the easiest possible measurement to do. You get a white light source. You shine it on tissue. You have a spectrometer and you pick up the light, you look at all the different wavelengths that are reflected. That's not a quantitative measurement. That's a qualitative measurement. And, and you'll see dips. So if this is a reflectance spectrum, what's the origin of that dip and that dip? Well, let's just say that dip right there. Why would that dip appear? Hemoglobin. That's a classic hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is sucking up the light, so there's less reflectance there. More reflectance here. You see a little less reflectance there. What, what's that dip from? I think this one's from fat, and this one's probably from water, because water is at about 980. So, so you can, this is probably from breast tissue.
the hemoglobin dip, about 7, yeah, 760. There's a really strong deoxyhemoglobin absorption there. Well, but we don't have, yeah, there's, but there's already, that's a big dip. We're, we're in a big dip there. Yeah, and this keeps going down. And if you keep going out here, you know, you'll be down here. <laughs> so this is just near infrared, you know, from. So what you can do then is you combine that power law fit with the reflectance spectrum. And you also know the absorption spectrum at those discrete wavelengths. So what is reflectance? Reflectance is just a combination of absorption and scattering. So now you can derive the entire absorption spectrum from that uncalibrated reflectance spectrum. It just requires that you do calibration at a few wavelengths, enough that you can come up with the A and the B parameters. And this is a pretty generalized principle that's used a lot in our field and in measurement science. You measure something that's known and you combine that with something that's you know varying in complex and part of that varying thing, you know something. So that's typically called in inverse problems a constraint. <laughs> so you're just imposing a constraint and solving an inverse problem with that constraint. The constraint here is we're going to know the wavelength dependence of scattering. And we have an additional constraint. We, we will know what the absorption is at a few discrete wavelengths as well. So that's how we get absorption and scattering spectra. And then here is fitting to near-infrared absorbers. And I think you're all familiar with these features, deoxyhemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, lipid, and water. The water and the lipid, is that electronic absorption? That's an, that's an overtone. Those are overtones, vibrational overtones. And they're co typically combination bands. So what's the overtone that we're looking at with lipid? CH. So that's typically sort of in the 2800 to sort of 3000 wave number region um, in, the, in the vibrational uh, spectrum. And so you're looking at overtones of CH here. What about uh, water at 980? That's also fundamental OH infrared vibration in the structural region. So these are incredibly important and easily accessible with all of our detector technology, all of our source. Of course, there are even stronger features if you go into the SWIR, the short wavelength infrared. And, and they can give you a lot of information. Yeah. Um, so then you can fit uh, to these chromophores. And what's nice about this approach is we've got a very broad band absorption spectrum. So that can potentially improve your, your fits. Um, and you can add things to your fits. So you can potentially put methemoglobin in, and we've shown exquisite sensitivity to methemoglobin formation and reduction. Um, you can put cytochrome in. Most of the measurements that we make, don't have, the tissues don't have a lot of cytochrome. Um, so if you're looking at... Uh, at breast tissue or fat tissue. Uh, there's just not, not that much cytochrome there. But um, not accounting for some of those components can lead to um, changes in the fit. And um, some of those inefficiencies or uh, lack of matching in the fit, we've exploited and others have exploited to identify um, mysterious components. We don't know exactly what they are. Uh, but those, those unaccounted for components can be important in diagnostics as well. As well. And so and some so of those we've characterized right, as being um, um, tumor components that are characteristic of malignant tumors. tumors. And they're, they're, they're not, not accounted for 100% for, uh, for in these fits. fits. So here's so some of the information you'll see that. Are you going to, did you did already demo or are you going to demo this afternoon? So I started working on this in the early, early, Actually, in 1990, and, uh, and uh, it took an it entire, entire room, room and, and we used an external neuronal cell, cell. Um, um, and, I, and I actually had to climb up on a table to align the laser with respect to a cell. cell. It's pretty, pretty cumbersome. cumbersome. Um, um, but the same, the same principle 
tables then as they are now. And so this is a board-based device where the production domain work is taking place inside of a very small module inside of this device. This device has both the frequency domain um, and the time and time in the spectroscopy. And there are different probes. probes. Uh, we tend to like the idea, the idea of being, of being able, able to put, put the detector directly on the patient. So, so in this case, the institution is actually an avalanche diode diode, and you can put directly on the patient. It's the most, it's the most efficient way to couple light and light detector detectors. Uh, but of course, you can use that with the medical fiber fibers. Um, and then and you, can, you can form images, so you can put your probes in multiple locations. locations. In every location, location you have the absorption spectra and scattering spectra, and then from that spectra, you try to calculate the any of those contrast elements. elements. Uh, so, uh, here's so here's a virtual image, image, image of, image of, of, a, of a, a grass gravitation. gravitation. Um, um, this, region this region has uh, uh, the, uh, the aerial or polar complex, so it's not got very much very much of this image of lipid. So this region has lots of lipid. Lipid is not, and you can see here different different spectra associated with the different regions. So, so you, said you said that you've gone through the spatial 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 domain. domain. Okay, okay. So you saw, so you saw all, all that. that. And, and, and did you see this? See this? Yeah, yeah. And did you, and see, did you see depth section? Depth section? Yeah. But did you but see, did this? see this? <laughs> so, I so I showed you before, before the contrast. contrast. So the main, so the main point, point that I want to communicate, we, the, the overriding structure, structure of the whole talk really has really been these techniques, techniques you can control path, path, path length. And, and you know, you have, you know, you have to take my word, my word for it that you're looking at short time times that you're looking at short path length. Path length. But it's very, but very easy to illustrate, illustrate the spatial frequency domain. 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 So here's so a here's picture of me again and again when you're looking at the element and that's less than 100 micron microns. So it's actually about 60 micron micron me and me. And so this is the super tissue issue. These are zero, zero frequency projections. So that's just that's easy. easy. But if I just just take the 800 nanometer light light, and I increase the frequency frequency to 2 per millimeter, you see you see entirely entirely different different contrast. You see light light that is not that is not treating as deeply, and you begin to see more and more visual structures are appearing. So it's really really remarkable to be able to do that. And you can imagine that you have higher and higher and higher frequencies and more and more and more visual information information content. So David, David certainly is talking about this, about this image or imager. He may not may not have told you about this, this super sophisticated device. device. So, so this is an access to project projector. And, and it happens, happens to have three, three LEDs. LEDs. And you can read Xander's paper, paper in the video. video. It has it has tried to get the LED LEDs out of this, out of this our own our own in. And we found we found basically as the LED LED, LED in it in it work really work well, well for looking at the nomination nation. So it's got a blue LED, blue LED that corresponds to the global absorption absorption. It's got it's got a green LED, LED, LED that's right at the right at the isotopic point point and a red a LED, LED, LED that corresponds to the optimum absorption absorption. 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 And, and and so you can use these types of devices, of devices, devices in particular for small, small animal animal imaging to quite power power that for that. But maybe you'll leave you'll leave it out here on other inverted clinical clinical things. Um, um, so so, so what are we using all of these things for? This sort of the the picture of what we're what we're after. And maybe maybe this is an old fashioned physiology of biology. biology. Probably good for you guys you guys kind of keep in mind mind. It's it's really really what we're looking for is a balance between oxygen supply and oxygen demand and that really needs to be maintained in the tissue. So that so there's a very increased demand at the mitochondrial level where we have we have a few millimeters of free oxygen tension. The vascular side, side where there's where there's higher higher oxygen tension arterial side about eight to nine millimeters. millimeters. This side side can respond. So if the so demand is very clear, how does the arterial side respond? respond? Let's say I say I'm searching for, for a word, word, and my and my neurons, neurons are, are working hard, 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 and they're trying to come up with a word, word. What's my what's my other side of side going to do? Dilate. Dilate. It's going to give me more more oxygen. more oxygen. I came up came up word I word I dilate. dilate. I got it. I got it. <laughs> So the, so the 
like it excited, 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 good balance. Good balance. But, but in general, in general this, this balance, balance will change, will change, 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 change,
have significant alteration in metabolism within a cell that leads to the creation of everybody's most most loathsome species. What are they called? The mitochondria is kind of to first approximation where there's combustion of fuel. So, so if the combustion is taking place beautifully, beautifully but anybody remember, remember what the carburetors are? What is the carburetor? The carburetor, the carburetor the the atom atom does. Mixes air, air and air and fuel, you get combustion. What if you have too much air? Or what if you have too, too much of one air. or the other? You, 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 you don't get... Yeah. yeah. And, and some, things some things don't come... Some things the fuel doesn't get completely burned. Burned? It could be, it could be round, round, round then, and go, go, go bad, bad chemical, chemical reactions, reactions and make, what is, what does everybody, does everybody take vitamin, vitamin, does anybody, does anybody take vitamins? <laughs> we're young, we're young, young people don't take them, only people, 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 people are aged. So why, so why, why, why do a lot of people take vitamins? Usually, usually you think of like a class of vitamins. Antioxidants. What are they, what are they trying to do? They're trying, they're trying to scavenge, scavenge reactive, reactive oxygen species. Where, where, where are the reactive oxygen species being created? <laughs> right, <laughs> right here. You keep, you keep making these things. They'll damage, they'll damage cell cells. They'll damage, they'll damage the endothelial cells. They'll, they'll, lead, they'll lead, lead to chemical, chemical reactions, reactions that cause changes, changes in the molecular, molecular structure. structure. So, so this, this is the cycle, cycle of disease process. process. And, and in, in optics, optics we're, in, we're in a great position. To be, to be able to measure cell, cell vascular, vascular coupling, coupling response. So we're, so we're, we're fortunate very fortunate in our, in our field. That these, these all have, have intrinsic, intrinsic signals. Did David, did David show you this? Okay, okay. So, so this, is this is an example, example not, of, not of cell vascular, vascular coupling, coupling, but, but uh, of. Well, it's kind of so bad. It's like a, like a hammer. hammer. <laughs> this is a really, it's really blunt, blunt force, force instrument. So here's, so here's the experiment. The experiment. So, we're, so we're working with Ron Stassi, who's a neuroscientist that has developed intrinsic psychological imaging techniques. And, and in each one, each one of these panels, panels we've, got we've got different, different things, things that measure, measure, measure with spatial domain, 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 domain imaging. And we've, and we've highlighted, highlighted them by looking at the deltas. So we're injecting potassium chloride. Anybody, anybody, anybody work with potassium chloride? chloride? Anybody, anybody, anybody know what it does? It's a it's, 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 it's 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 horribly. Um, um, I, believe I believe it's, it's going to prove uh, uh, death, death uh, uh, in, 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 in some in some, in some, like throw, throw, something in some places. Because it goes wacko. So, so you get you get a phenomenon. You get the so neuron, neurons are stunned. They become, they become polarized. polarized. And, you, and, and you get a coherent, coherent phenomenon known as cortical spreading depression. Now, this, now, this, this isn't just an exercise, exercise in interesting, interesting optics. Cortical, cortical spreading depression is, is a real, a real phenomenon that occurs in people's brains in a large population. population. And, and, and what, what population, population and what, and what condition, condition um, um, is, is, is associated with what we call cortical spreading depression. Searching for I'm trying to dilate my blood vessels. It begins with, it begins an, with an M. Migraine. migraine. That's what, That's a, migraine what a migraine looks like. If you, if you ever, ever have a migraine, this is, this is what, what is going on in, in your cortex. So, so you, in, you inject potassium chloride, chloride in the brain. In the brain. A rat. A rat. Here's the change, change in scattering. scattering. Change, change, change in saturation. In saturation. Total, total, total hemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin. And oxyhemoglobin. And, and so, so I'm going, I'm going to, to stop, stop this. Okay, okay, right there. Right there. So you, so you saw this scattering wave. wave. Now this is not scattering, scattering from, from one neuron. One neuron. Right, a, lot, right, a, lot a lot of people, people are trying to do work in looking, in looking at optical, optical signals, signals scattering from, from one, one neuron, neuron or two neurons. neurons. That's extremely, That's extremely difficult, difficult to do. You need hearing, hearing imaging techniques. This is scattering, scattering from, from thousands, thousands of neurons. Of neurons. But they're all happening synchronously because cortical, cortical spreading depression is slow-moving slow wave. We've 
we have accelerated this. It's moving at a few millimeters per minute, like four, five, four or five millimeters per minute. So it, so it moves across the cortex. This is, this is the front, front wave, the wave. So, so it's occurring because, because there's ionic alterations. You get, you get different, 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 different water, water content and, and swelling, swelling and shrinkage of neurons. So that's, so that's scattering. It's happening, it's happening with, with, with lots of neurons. Of neurons. Now, now, as the wave, as the wave, wave propagates across, across the, neurons, the neurons, you know, you know become metabolically again. active again. So the so wave, wave, wave in scattering, scattering is, is, is indicative of the stunning, stunning of the neurons. The neurons. The stop, 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 the stopping of the metabolism of the functioning of the neurons. And then they, and then they come back. Come back. And, so and so what happens, what happens behind, behind the wave in space and time, time is you have, is you have an, an, an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. As, as there's, there's an increase, increase in metabolism and an increase in oxygen extraction. As these, as these neurons that have, have had their, had their ionic, ionic character all screwed, all screwed up, now, now things, are things are restoring back, back to normal. normal. They, 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 they're they're boxed out of starved and they suck, suck up the oxygen. oxygen. It's like it's when, like when you hold your breath for a really long time and then you take a gas. So you need to get that oxygen. And that's occurring at the expense of oxygenated hemoglobin. So this drops and saturation drops. So the area, so the area is reperfused. So that's so that's a chemical, chemical exa example of the of the optical bulb, bulb effect. effect. Let's, let's, let's look at another another example, example of the optical bulb, bulb effect. So so <coughs> this is what Pontrosti does. He typically, he typically just uses 630 nanometer light, which is which is looking primarily, primarily at deoxyhemoglobin, and he and he he looks, he looks at the reflectance of 630 nanometer light. If you, if you look at the cortex, and, and the, cor the cortex has, has Im 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 can, is imprinted in various regions by different, by different sensory inputs. So he, so he tends to look at barrel cortex, which, which in, in rats has a very, very large representation by these, these barrels, cortical barrels. They're columns that, that each barrel cor corresponds to a different whisker on a rat. On a rat. So, so rat whiskers. Have a, take lot, a lot of rat cortex, and, and if you wiggle a whisker, that stimulates the neural activity. To sustain that neural activity, you have to have a vascular response. That's called, that's called neurovascular coupling. So, so, what do you see if you wiggle a whisker? Initially, this is, this is the reflectance as a function of time, normalized to the original the intrinsic reflectance before you, before you stimulate. So, so first you start to see a dip in that reflectance, and this is an image of that dip. You start to see that it begins to appear at about 500 microseconds, microseconds or just milliseconds, and, and uh, it, it kind of peaks at about a second. So that's, so that's a dip. So, so if that's a dip, what does, that, what does that mean in terms of the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin? You're increasing the deoxyhemoglobin. So, so there's more deoxyhemoglobin, so there's less light that's reflected back. And then if you keep following the reflectance after the wiggling of the whisker, what happens? The reflectance increases. So that's reflectance at 630. What is that increase? Less deoxyhemoglobin. Why would there be less deoxyhemoglobin? You're compensating. You're, the brain is super paranoid about oxygen. It doesn't want to have low oxygen tension. And so it responds with shock and awe, a massive response to the perception of reduced oxygen tension. So in this initial event, Stimulated just by the wiggling of the whisker, there's extraction of oxygen. There's an increase in deoxyhemoglobin in the region. That low oxygen tension experience is not something the brain wants to live through. So it responds massively by reperfusing that region. And <coughs> reperfusion reduces the deoxyhemoglobin content. How? Through what process? Very simple. Dilution. 
right? The blood vessels are opening up, and it's just whoosh. So now it's just uh, the deoxyhemoglobin is diluted out. And this overshoot, this reperfusion, is how many of you heard of fMRI bold? That is the fMRI bold response. And a lot of the interest in optics, particularly in optical brain imaging, comes about because there's a huge amount of work from our field that's helped explain the mechanisms behind the bold signal in fMRI. Now, fMRI is really beautiful. You can do it in people. You can get 3D images. You know, we can't do that with 3D depth resolve bold imaging. There is a lot of work in our field going on to do multiple source detector pairs and do tomography and look at cortical responses. And probably the most state of the art that I've seen is work that Joe Culver has done. He's been able to show even better resolution, both in time and space, with optical techniques than fMRI, at least for cortical structures. He can't go deep into subcortical structures. So that's pretty interesting. But this is the fundamental break it down. What is going on? Initially, there's an oxygen extraction. This is called the initial dip. That's responded to in order to sort of pay back the oxygen debt. There's an overshoot and then an undershoot. And you can follow these time courses. How does fMRI detect any of that? Why is that so popular with fMRI? What does fMRI actually see? What does MRI see? Protons. What type of signal or is it looking for? In a magnetic field. So here we've got deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. Will either of those impact the magnetic field? Actually, only deoxy impacts the magnetic field. Because why? It's paramagnetic. So if deoxyhemoglobin is close to the protons, and for those of you guys in BME, what, where are those protons coming from in MRI? Water, our favorite contrast agent. It's a really good contrast agent in MRI, in optics, in x-ray. Yeah, that's true. Hemoglobin might be. I don't know. We like all the contrast. <laughs> optics is, is good. It measures everything. But, so, yeah, this is, a, this is a phenomenon where it's really quite sensitive. Yes, Vasan. Can you explain the uh, reason for the undershoot at the end? Because after the vessels dilate, does it constrict a little too quickly? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really sure what the undershoot is, is from. But it's definitely something that they observe both in fMRI and in optical neurovascular stuff. It may just be a fluid dynamics thing. But it's interesting because the undershoot is just as large as the initial. Yeah. And if you follow it, Absolutely, there is ringing that goes on until it completely damps out. Yeah. So, <clears throat> getting back to exactly what this bold response is in fMRI. So we know we're looking at protons. Water is all over the place. And if you get an increase in the deoxyhemoglobin, that's paramagnetic. So it changes the, the T2 relaxation times. It increases those relaxations. It makes them go faster. You basically, you put a magnet in a magnetic field that alters the relaxation time. But that's a fairly small effect and kind of hard to see. People argue over this in MRI. But what a really big effect is, is when you take those little magnets away. So when you get this huge reperfusion, you dilute out the deoxyhemoglobin. And that's the origin of the bold response that you see in fMRI. So it's the 
backwards. <laughs> you know, it's not a direct measurement. It's a measurement of the loss of a material inside the brain. That's what we're looking at in MRI. In optics, we have the advantage of being able to look directly at both oxy and deoxy at the same time. And I think what I'll do then is I'll, I'll just conclude with one example of how you can see that with, with optical imaging. And, and so get, this is getting back to that $200. Tom? In the reflectance, how much of that do you think is due to scattering change, though? So it's, uh, we've, we've tried to track that down. And it's, it's probably a very, very small, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's still an unanswered question. I don't, I don't feel like at first we thought that was the most important question. And we spent a lot of time trying to really get to the bottom of that and make absorption and scattering measurements. Um, but the neuroscientists don't really actually care so much about that. <laughs> I think that there's opportunity in the scattering measurement, and I guess what you'll have to do is come back next year, or maybe I'll just keep talking tomorrow. Because <laughs> I we've now been able to look at the scattering fluctuations in hemodynamic signals, not necessarily looking in the brain, but you can see them just as a result of your heart beating, and you know there's just a whole lot of really interesting stuff in the scattering for sure. So I think that there's still a lot of potential for that. Um, so this is an example of probably the world's cheapest brain imager. So a few hundred dollar AXA projector. And we're using essentially the pattern projections onto our animal. This is a mouse. And here, rather than wiggling a whisker, we're shocking the hind paw. So, you know, you've got the homunculus and all the sensory input, and so you can see where everything is on your cortex uh, with respect to um, all of your sensory inputs. And the same thing is true for small animals. So there's a region, there are maps on the brain that correspond to different regions of sensory input from whiskers to paws and everything. Um, and... Uh, Hind paw stimulation with a shock is like, again, a shock and awe stimulation. So it just, everything lights up in the cortex when you hit it with a, a shock. And this is what we're really interested in. And this is early, these are early days in this kind of research, but um, there's a lot of stuff coming out now uh, that supports this clinically. We want to know what's happening to your vascular structures in the brain during neurodegenerative diseases, and in particular in Alzheimer's disease. And, and so first, if you, if you look, at this is a mouse model of Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. It's a transgenic mouse model. And if you just look at the normal aging process, there's diminished total hemoglobin content in the cortex over time. And a 20-month-old mouse is the equivalent in this mouse model of a pretty old mouse or a pretty old human. And in Alzheimer's disease, there's an even faster reduction in the total hemoglobin, the total vascular content in the brain. And so we published a few papers now, and Xander, uh, this is the topic of his dissertation, trying to understand and hypothesize why there's a degradation in vascular content. There's also a degradation in vascular tone and vascular neurovascular coupling that you can pick out with SFDI experiments. And, and this is one of those. So you can visualize the hind paw stimulation. This is just looking at the 530 nanometer total hemoglobin reflectance, the dynamics of that. So you can really visualize it. So here's the control. Here's the Alzheimer's disease. And you can see just by sitting back looking at the images, there's a different temporal behavior different temporal pattern. And if you break that down, this is the bold response. So you have stimulation. And this is, these are, this is the mean of 13 animals. So here's the control, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and these are the triple transgenics. It's really dramatically different. Both the total area under the curve and 
the relaxation times of the stimulus. So this tells us that there are significant changes that are occurring in that balance between the supply side and the demand side. And they can be driven, everyone thinks of neurofibrillary plaques and tangles and so forth. So they're certainly occurring in the neurons, but they're also occurring in the vasculature. And there's a lot of debate and discussion over what is the chicken and what is the egg. And it's, it's clear that you can't have a discussion about neurodegenerative diseases without looking at the vasculature. And these types of results have now been validated by various clinical groups using fMRI. Um, and a recent uh, study just came out from a group at Beth Israel um, that looked at in fMRI in human subjects and found significant impairment. The sad story of all this, of course, is that even if we had a great optical technique that we could put on people and do simple neurovascular coupling uh, checks, which you could do with finger tapping, or you can always do electric shock on people, um, or something else, we, there's nothing we can do about it yet, right now. From everything I've seen, the best, uh, the best prevention and attenuation of Alzheimer's disease symptoms is, uh, is actually, well, does anybody know what it is? Tom knows what it is. Exercise. Exercise. It's the only serious therapy out there. And it really does work. And there's a lot of work going on to try to understand the molecular mechanisms of that. And again, that's part of you know, my future talk. Uh, I have some slides in there as to potentially how that works and what that does to the brain. So we have probes that we can look at people exercising. And we can look at exactly what's happening with blood flow and oxygen consumption in the brain. So we've got exercise. We've got disease. We've got all kinds of things that we can do do with optical imaging. What about like mental exercises? Mental exercises, they are strongly recommended, but I, from what I understand, the, if you try to sort of separate the two and, and say, I mean, that's, that's got to be done, mental challenges, but physical exercise actually has more of a relatively higher therapeutic impact than just mental alone. So you have to move. You have to move. Yes? It, it seems like the, uh, from a kinetic standpoint, if the blood is moving faster, that oxidation is going to, uh, oxidation that doesn't happen on a very fast time scale uh, uh, is, is not going to be as likely in that one area that you might carry it past the, the, uh, the reactive site in the brain or whatever, and that it will oxidize something else. There, there are so many benefits, and... <clears throat> You know, I, I don't even know a fraction of them. It, when you talk to people who look at sort of the molecular science of exercise, we have our own first approximations, and, I'm, and that's certainly, I think, a very important benefit. But there's a lot of knowledge now of what that enhanced blood flow does, what is triggered, what it, how it interacts and activates the immune system. Probably it's all fundamentally immunomodulatory. And again, from my very 40,000 foot view, I would say that the immune system is kind of like the Maxwell's equations equivalent of biology. So if you know Maxwell's equations, you can explain all of optics and photonics. If you could write the equations for the immune system, you would be able to explain Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease and you know, diabetes and basically virtually every, all of these phenomena. Because it's either the immune system working as it should be helping you, or the immune system gone crazy in some sense and accelerating your demise. In the case of uh, glycosylation of tissues, uh, what I think happens is that the, uh, the high level of glucose uh, proceeds, uh, uh, increases the rate of the reaction of glycosylation of tissues. So it, it looks like it's maybe a rarely crude first order approximation with glucose concentration. And uh, that doesn't seem to be an immune system thing. And it does do the neuro damage. And the but it actually, damage. so everything is connected. Okay. So those high levels of glucose could, can be driven by a process known as insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Where is the insulin resistance coming from? If you eventually draw, connect all the dots, mm -hmm. there's an immune implication 
there's a significant lipid metabolism implication. It goes back to the metabolism of lipids and glucose mm -hmm. and whether or not you have, say, the right lipid particles mm -hmm. to engage and be a very good partner with your immune system. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, everything is connected, but all of those things are, I think, absolutely accurate mm -hmm. downstream explanations. The further upstream we go, the more <coughs> insanely complex it gets. But I think absolutely to a first approximation, we want to drive perfusion, drive perfusion challenges, uh, create vasodilatory responses uh, in tissues, make them work as they're supposed to work with some frequency and intensity. You want to have a high amount of skeletal muscle, which is the biggest glycogen store in the body. And if you have high skeletal muscle to lipid ratio, then you'll have a much healthier uh, uh, overall glucose level and, and not necessarily have to be subjected to those glycosylation products. So it's all, it's all obviously complicated, but I think we're, we are um, quite fortunate in terms of all, all of these technologies uh, to be able to see underlying signals. And I think, you know, by giving you these examples, um, you get a sense for the power of the technique. So I'll just summarize all this stuff and I have many, many examples. Maybe you'll have to go to the Venn Summer School uh, where it's a four-hour lecture and I give all this stuff out in doses. And then that's a really, it's a fantastic, it's an experience like this. It's a week-long intensive experience. Um, and you get a lot of, uh, you get lecturers talking about every one of the main topics in biophotonics. But <clears throat> from a kind of a summary point of view, all these methods that we, all of us, our community, we're developing are, are sensitive to drug and radiation therapies, can be providing feedback, uh, can be used obviously in surgical guidance, um, in predicting risk and outcome for individuals. Just measuring your baseline properties without any perturbation, looking at what your brain oxygenation is, those types of things can be very valuable and will become increasingly important in medical decision making. And then of course multimodality is absolutely essential. Being able to combine multiple optical modalities as well as optics with other complementary modalities. And this is where I think we're going um, with these things, continuous sensors. And we've got you know, outstanding people. You've met a lot of them this week. Um, a lot of the work in DOSI is is work Tom and Anais and Brian, Amanda, Rob, Gautham, Alex are doing um, in SFDI. I didn't get to show you uh, some of the stuff that uh, Kyle just finished and helped leverage his job into Fitbit. So anyway, I think that's pretty much the whole picture. So thanks very much. Anybody have perfusion left in their brains? <laughs> you know, one of the things I think is interesting that I'd like to have you comment on is that um, with, the, with a lot of the fitness devices, of course, they're not regulated and, and nobody knows how accurate they are. Uh, they probably don't even have a specification they have to meet. Uh, but they have a really low entry uh, to the market because they have no, uh, no regulatory barriers speaking, financially. Speaking of Fitbit, you mean? Uh, of, of all of them, Apple. Yeah, you know, you know, so it doesn't matter. All of them pretty much have that. And I, I'd, I'd uh, you know, when I heard you talking before about the big data uh, collected with all these data, all I could think of is big data with lots of errors. Yeah, I'd like to have you comment on that. I think so. I am I am exactly trying to put a panel together for this NIH workbench to bedside workshop on that topic, and I've been trying to get Apple, Google, Fitbit. I tried to get Massimo, um, but uh, Joe and Sean politely declined. So everyone says they're interested, but it, that is a discussion that I want, I want to try to get going in the context, because our field is obsessed with accuracy. And then, you know, getting stuff into the marketplace, that's really obviously driven by different factors. But there is a convergence, and there is, there is a lot of opportunity in that convergence. And I, ha I, I don't know it, but 
based on the hiring that Apple has done and the people that they're bringing in, because they, have co of course, can't, I mean, one day they, they can talk to you and the next day they can't. <laughs> so, but it, I feel like that's the direction that they're trying to go in. Now, whether or not, you know, they're going to have sort of stratification of devices, so there's the low barrier to entry, fun consumer thing, and will they spin that into more serious, more accurate devices? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think that there's, um, I mean, they're obviously the experts on understanding the markets, but I, I think the, the profit motive is in, and this is what I would like to get them in a dialogue on, is in the potential to really fundamentally transform healthcare. So if you think about an MRI and how many megabits of megabytes of information content is in a single image, it's super dense. But how often do you get a full body or full organ MRI? Even if you're following a disease process, you, you'll sort of only get it once a year. But if you're not, you may not have one for 10 or 20 years, or let's just say five years. Let's compare that. That's static, static anatomy. Let's compare that to dynamic physiology at kilohertz, sampling rates, low bit information content, maybe, by comparison to the MRI, but continuously. And, and now you're, you, you, you've got kind of a comparator detector opportunity. You're looking at what happened one second later or two seconds later compared to, so you're super sensitive to changes. So I would argue that the huge potential is there to have people streaming their health content into smart databases that are able to pick up, well, your dichrotic notch is now a little bit different, so you're probably having some problem with valve stiffening and you need an appointment with your cardiologist. That's not going to get picked up on <clears throat> the echocardiogram that you happen to have once every 10 years. Well, maybe it'll get picked up then, but you could do something about it earlier. So it's kind of like, I like to think of it as uh, the movies. You know, sometimes we go to the movie theater, but increasingly less often. Most of the times we're, we're sitting at home streaming. So in the future, sometimes we'll go to the doctor. Actually, probably the present. Sometimes <laughs> we, sometimes we go to the doctor. But, um, you know, if you can stream that information, you can control it yourself to some extent, and you can use what is increasingly becoming what is obvious as one of the most powerful medications, that is exercise. The Francis Collins announced a director's fund to stimulate more research in exercise as a serious medical intervention, not just to become more fit, although that's a good side effect. So, yeah. So, I mean, that, as a dialogue, I would really like to, if you can get Joe, convince Joe to get in on that discussion. I'm not sure what I can <laughs> I think there have to be some market opportunities for those companies there. Vossen. Um, just to follow on and maybe amplify the points you're making, it's not optics related, but one of our colleagues in BME, Michelle Kine, she's come up with a sensor to put on the abdomens of pregnant women because there's very little information about uh, the movement of, of fetuses yeah. and how that can relate to, you know, pregnancy complications. And again, very low bit rate information, but continuous monitoring. And there's very little known about that. And there are tremendous opportunities for reduction and complication of pregnancies and early intervention if something's going on. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, one thing we found is that every time we increase the frequency of our measurements, as in measure more often, whatever it is we're trying to measure. We see something that we'd never seen or even couldn't even have predicted. So a classic example um, is your, your guy's mentor, Darren. So when we, we had all this data, we were measuring breast cancer patients in chemotherapy uh, pretty often. We were measuring why were we doing it, we didn't know, but we were trying to measure them the first day after the infusion, in the first week after infusion, and 
we had all this data, and it wasn't until Darren came along and actually analyzed it <laughs> and said, oh my gosh, look at what's happening. This is amazing. In the first day, these patients are undergoing a really unique response that we really hadn't seen before. We, we had seen some aspects of it, and um, uh, actually I had presented it at a big breast cancer meeting, and I wasn't even in tune to it until somebody in the audience came up to me from Japan and said, hey, we see that same type of phenomenon in our PET data. So we think that that's a metabolic flare response in PET. And you know, then we were able to dig deeper into it. Darren and Shigeto eventually came from Japan to work with us on it. I mean, a great story of how increasing the frequency of your sampling without knowing beforehand. So what if you had just all that stuff? And then you had infinitely smart postdocs and grad students who were analyzing the dynamics. <laughs> yeah, Watson. Yeah.